so there are quite a few different theories of uh, acupuncture physiology. How does acupuncture work? Now we know what the points are, <coughs> where they exist. How does it actually work? And I uh, just took out three of the most common theories because there's really a lot of theories. The beauty of theories is that the more theories they are, what it really means is nobody really knows. <laughs> That's why it's all theory. If they knew it, it wouldn't be a theory, it would be a fact. So a lot of people they postulate all sorts of different ideas out there. And uh, these are the more common ones. So we know that it sort of activates endogenous pain um, in every system at the various CNS levels. So what they do is that they actually uh, it's very corresponding, uh, very closely related to the gate control theory. So we, when we touch something painful, um, a hot kettle, for example, what really, really happens is that the sensation triggers our nerves, brings a message up to our brain, our brain register pain, 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 <coughs> hot, hot, hot. When we see it, take your hands off it, close it back again, then you remove your hand. Okay. So what the gate theory proposes is that the acupuncture, what it does is that it stops that communication at the spine. So despite that action, the message doesn't get sent up to the brain. If the brain doesn't register pain, it doesn't really matter. Because your hand don't register the pain. Your, 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 your hand hasn't got brains in it. It's just a sensory organ to transfer that message to the brain. So what they are sort of postulating is that it well may not be that acupuncture actually causes energesia, it causes hypoenergesia uh, hy whereby you don't feel it rather than pain relief. So that's one of the theories. Um, we certainly know it releases endorphins, uh, cortisol, serotonin, nor norepinephrine and other sort of neurotransmitters that has been uh, measured. So you can measure all those levels before you do acupuncture and measure it after again. So we certainly know that there is a physiological, biochemical exchange that releases uh, all these sort of different uh, neurotransmitters. Techniques and instrumentation. So there is quite a few different ways of doing acupuncture as well. So if we dissect the word acupuncture, <coughs> acu, we're talking about something that is sharp, something that is pointing. Puncture is poking a hole, so to speak. Okay? So, Needle acupuncture, or what we call dry needling, because it's dry and you're just sticking a needle into acupuncture places. Uh, that is one technique, that's one that has been uh, used. Most people are familiar with it, that's what they've seen before. Um, electro acupuncture is whereby you attach an electrode to the needle, so you actually send in a current, um, and, uh, and I'll elaborate more than that in a bit. So it's a, just a little bit more stimulating than just a needle acupuncture. Uh, moxibustion. It is whereby you uh, stick a burning moxa, moxa is a type of plant, um, or at the end of the needle that transmits the heat down into the acupuncture point to further stimulate the acupuncture point as well. And um, okay, I'll come back to that in a bit as well. There's some nice pictures for you. Uh, aquapuncture, okay, as the name suggests, you're injecting a liquid of some form into the acupuncture points. So not only do you stick a needle into where the acupuncture points are, you're actually injecting a liquid and there's a lot of different varieties that use saline, vitamins, local anesthetics, non steroidal inflammatories or, and steroids. Uh, same again to, to stimulate the acupuncture point a bit more. Uh, implantation, this one is a bit more sort of, uh, not, not so common these days, probably more in China, whereby they actually implant go beads um, for arthritis, long term, so epilepsy, uh, for arthritis, we certainly do not do that in animals. Can you imagine if we injected, uh, if we put in gobies? Uh, I think the, the <laughs> animal gets stolen for different reasons. <laughs> uh, there you go. Yeah. So these are acupuncture needles. So usually they're stainless steel. It all depends on um, on on the the usage really. So in the past, uh, as I explained to you when I was uh, in basketball, we had our own needles, and the acupuncturist would have uh, alcohol Bunsen burner and she would sterilize the needles before sticking in and we kept our needles ourselves but certainly time has uh, sort of uh, gone from there now we just use stainless steel one single use disposable needles and uh, they are usually flexible and the tip is actually rounded, it's not sharp so it slides through the skin rather than cut through the skin and it's not unusual for us to stick a needle in and take that needle out and you find there's no bleeding at all because we actually, we actually didn't cut anything uh, I've got some needles over here if you guys fancy <laughs> trying. Uh, but, <laughs> yes. uh, like I said, we use a lot of disposable needles these days rather than reusable. 
it can be auto play for those reusable ones, but we tend to use um, sort of uh, disposable, uh, disposable ones. And as you can see as well, there are different ways of uh, putting the needle in. It's not always just straight ahead. So there's perpendicular. It all depends where the acupuncture point is because some of them may not be on the surface. It could be somewhat deeper, and that would also change what size needles we use. So our smallest needles is our sort of uh, 15 millimeter needles, about that big. We use it for small animals, cats, puppies, uh, small dogs, <coughs> or or if you want very superficial points. Um, an example, there are some points that is just above the bone. You can't stick anything for that. I don't care how big the dog is. The bone is the bone, it's just below the skin. So for that, you use various superficial needles. And uh, we have as long as 80 uh, millimeter, which is about that long, uh, which we used to use in horses. Um, and uh, some parts in humans as well. <laughs> so electroacupuncture, uh, as I elaborated a bit, was putting an electric current inside there. Okay, it's used mainly for pain control. And um, it's sort of variable. Uh, it's variable in voltage and variable in frequency. The frequency is certainly much, much more uh, important than all the other two factors. Uh, it is contraindicated in more severe cardiac disease because, as we know, in cardiac ECG, then there is electrical imp uh, sort of impulses conducting through a heart. It's also uh, sort of it's because sometimes it is quite. So why use electrical acupuncture? So when we stick a needle in for dry acupuncture we are stimulating the acupuncture point. Ideally, what I want to do if I want to stimulate the acupuncture point more is I would do that to the point. Because literally I'm just irritating the point more, so to speak. Physically, I can't be doing that for half an hour for all the other needles. So that's why I attach a little electrode that throws out a frequency. And the frequency, I'm not really using the energy of the power <coughs> to shock the animal or anything like that. All it does is just makes a needle uh, jerk, so to speak and to, 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 to simulate what I would do if I'm just doing that. So that is what we do. So it is to stimulate the acupuncture point and as I mentioned before, some acupuncture points or a lot of acupuncture points, they can make the animal more sleepy. And it's not unusual for them to actually fall asleep after a sleep and just sit down and just ah. And that's why in um, uh, human medicine, when you are going for acupuncture, the acupuncturist usually will ask you, are you going to be driving? to go home after this because some people they do get quite strongly affected by that and they have to just rest and it's a bit dangerous to drive. So for nervous and exhausted animals, we probably will not be using electric acupuncture because the stimulation will be too hard, maybe too much, just to be dry needling for that. Pregnant animals, mm, there, there is that whole question about okay, is it going to affect the fetus and all this sort of, sort of thing, so for safety we just don't really do that. And for animals with active malignancy, this is also a little bit uh, interesting whereby the theory is that if there is cancer and if you use electroacupuncture, because you're stimulating the acupuncture points uh, that may potentiate the meridian, the, the meridians, you may cause the cancer to spread faster. So hence we don't use that as well over there. So moxibustion, this is human by the way, uh, it's hard to do on animals uh, for two different reasons. One is that moxa, when you actually burn it, it smells like weed. <laughs> so I think it's uh, not very nice for a vet practice. <laughs> we walk around and like, what? I don't know what they're doing inside there. It's not a vet practice. So most likely we stay clear of that. And the second more practical reason is that we don't really want the dog to catch on fire. <laughs> because they've got fur. Humans, no fur is okay, but you know, with long hair, and it's like, you know, put fire, it's like, mm. So uh, we don't really use moxibustion in animals at all. And if we wanted to increase the stimulation, which is what moxibustion is, basically to heat up the needle to stimulate the acupuncture point, we use uh, electric puncture. And um, this, this is not me, but this is what I had done in Singapore when I got back pain, and they were doing all these things. It looks like torture, but it's actually quite nice. <laughs> So when do we use it? So when do we use it? We use it for pain relief. Um, but usually, usually in my experience, we use it a lot for pain relief. Um, in other countries, they use it for anesthesia, which I'll talk about in a bit. But for pain relief, usually for either chronic pain or post-op pain, um, or if the animal needs pain relief but the owner does not want to use any drugs, or the animal actually can't take any drug because of contraindications and maybe kidney failure and things like that. So, we mentioned before about it, uh, the gate control theory. A, 
Right? So electro acupuncture, just point to note, it goes in low and high frequency. <coughs> and there are differences between the two frequency, and uh, this is why. So when we go low frequency, we are talking about getting two hertz, which means uh, two taps uh, per second, so to speak. Okay? Um, and what we know is that it induces central release of uh, endorphins and encephalins. It is the induction time is quite slow. It's usually you know about sort of 10, 10, 10 20 minutes, and it's also cumulative. And we know it's also abolished by naloxone. No, so naloxone is an opioid antagonist. Okay, so just to explain a little bit, agonist is to push something forward, antagonist is the antidote, so to speak. Okay. So if I would use opioids like morphine and I were to overdose an animal on morphine for whatever reason, I want to reverse the effects of morphine, I'll use naloxone. Okay, so it's the antagonist of that. Okay. So if we use naloxone and we're doing low frequency acupuncture and we know that the low frequency will not work because we use naloxone, it would be it would be almost commonsensical or, or realistic to speculate or postulate that low frequency releases some form of opioid. That is why when you give an opioid antagonist, it stops working. Yep. Okay. So high frequency, now we're going to you know 100 to 200 hertz. So it's much faster. Okay. And that one we talk, we, we know that it, it sort of induces release of serotonin, uh, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. It's non-cumulative. It doesn't really release any opioids that way. Okay. Um, it is unaffected by naloxone, so when you, that's why we know that it's probably not opioid based of the neurotransmitters that's being sort of, a, um, a sort of a release using acupuncture. <coughs> and uh, the, the, major, the major effect is by decre the, decreasing the, the descending inhibition of the spinal tract. So just shutting down the gates at the back over here. And like I said, if you have got arthritis in your knee or in your hip, if we're shutting the gates down on your spine so that the pain over there doesn't go up to your brain, the brain doesn't register the pain. <coughs> it is still there, but you don't feel the pain. <coughs> Does it make sense? Yeah, okay. And so which one is better? That they're both good. So it is not uncommon for personally for me, I always use both. So the the because the acupuncture, the, the electric acupuncture system that we use, we can program it, so we can jump between the two. So we're having the best of both worlds, of a bit of serotonin, let's say, a bit of opioids, pain relief, um, and that's how we can use it function. <coughs>